Howdy everybody in YouTube land. This video is about the Weather Star 3. The original Weather Star. Well, this is version 3, but um, they're all basically the same on the inside except for a couple of little differences, but we'll get to that in a minute. This is on loan to me, belongs to someone else. I had to reverse engineer this thing a couple years ago to figure out the data protocol standard for communicating with this one, but more importantly, the Weather Star Junior, which I covered in a previous video. This is the Weather Star 3. Um, this guy is not common. There's only two people that I know who own these machines, and one of them loaned me this one. So I don't know exactly you know how many are left out there in the wild or whatever these were supposedly retired in 2003 or 2004 somewhere in there because of some FCC rules change with the alerts but anyways this video is about a couple of things one is I want to do a hardware overview of this video of this this unit because I haven't done that yet and we also need to do some repairs to this unit because there's a couple of little problems with it um, that we need to solve so plus it needs some restoration work but Without further ado, let's take a look at what we have going on on the inside. This faceplate here is completely removable. You can actually, it's held in by pins, and I don't think I can get in here. So what I'm going to do is grab a screwdriver and just pop it, get it between here and pop it loose. And then it should, without trouble, pull it out. So this is acrylic it's just you know a piece of plexiglass or something like that with screen printing on it silk screen um, then once you remove that it reveals the three boards that are in here and the serial number and all of that stuff the, the original weather star that was released in 1982 when the weather channel became a thing had a different board here and that board was designed to pick off the data through the vertical blinking interval. So just above line 19, there's there's some space for, um, you know, closed captioning data and stuff like that. But there's also some text line or some lines in there that would contain the teletext data to run this machine. The Star 2 came out. Um, that was the original Star. Star 2 came out to fix some noise problems and... Um, stuff like that that were that they couldn't figure that out and they they released a star two in response to that but the hardware is pretty much the same and then um sorry discords in the background driving me nuts but anyway so the star two star one same thing but the star three is basically a star two with a subcarrier data board so they did away with the um, the the vertical blinking interval stuff and replaced it with an RF subcarrier. Why they did this is a controversy. Who knows? We don't know. But as far as I'm aware of, there are no surviving units that anyone owns that still has the original vertical blinking interval VBI data board. They all have the subcarrier board. So basically, when you put a subcarrier board in a star one, two, or three, they all become a star three at that point. So they're all star threes, even though the the graphics board and the digital boards all that's basically the same between all of them it's just star 2 came out in response of, of noise from the star 1 and star 3 basically is a subcarrier so anyways everything as far as that's concerned is is all we know but um so without further ado let's go ahead and take the lid off and let's take a look on the inside of how this thing is set up so as you can tell this scene has seen a lot of usage. Uh, it's been it's been used a lot. So, first thing we notice right away is the power supply is a linear power supply. It has a, a magnetic standard iron core transformer with laminated cores, and uses the series pass voltage regulators on the board. Um, I don't know what health the capacitors are in. Um, that's something we need to take a look at. It looks like they're made by Illinois capacitors. And those are Nichicons back then. We have this big tank here. Um, under this box are three of those 
dry cell batteries like you see in the Macintosh portable. Same exact batteries. And then there's the tag down there. The weather channel power supply. So that will definitely need attention sometime. Um, meanwhile, we have uh, shipping damage back here. Uh, the, star, the other thing, Star 1. And Star 1 and Star 2 have the VBI input, or the, the uh, they have no subcarrier input jack. They had to add that afterwards and run a wire in. But subcarrier comes native on Star 3, so that's why there's a subcarrier back here. So what we're going to do now is take a look at that so we know what that actually looks like back here. So there is, don't know if you can see it or not, but there's all your different inputs but that's what we have so let's start let's take a look at these boards one by one so we can go through them and kind of do a brief overview of what they are it's going to be very brief but we'll get there so the first board that we need to take a look at is this one right here I don't have them pushed all the way in because they're very very hard to get out of these slots but the first board we're going to take a look at, this board has a fault somewhere that i got to figure out. The lower display line is stuck using the local sensors instead of the data coming in, so that we need to, we need to do something with that, but um, also, this is the board that I had to reverse engineer. This is the subcarrier data board. Uh, this one has a 75 ohm resistor that's completely toasted and that's on the subcarrier input so I'm wondering if this thing got hit by lightning and that's why we're having logic problems but anyways um, this has inside this shield which you can't see is a um, F two FM receivers one of them is audio which is mapped through here and you know, there's a 4066 somewhere in here. There's an op amp, and then there's a um, let's see, there it is, 4052, I think. Yeah, I thought there was a 4066 in here. That might be a 4052. Yeah, there's an analog mux, and that allows you to switch the audio input from the rear, as well as what's coming out of the subcarrier receiver over FM. So. The transponder on the satellite would be somewhere around 25 megahertz wide and you would have your video, then you have your audio, and then next to that would be multiple subcarriers which would come over the baseband out of the receiver. Um, this would tune in the um, audio, FM audio, from the satellite like if they wanted to send down you know, Dan Chandler narrations or whatever else or alternative music, they can do that on one of those channels. The other FM channel is the FSK data channel, and that gets connected into these chips here, which run off into this section here. This section here is responsible for demodulating the FSK subcarrier and decoding it back into a bitstream, which gets loaded into this chip here. This chip here is the FIFO. Or first in first out and that's responsible for buffering the teletext frames and allowing the processor to read them and actually there is a pretty sure it's this one here it uses an 8085 Intel made by Toshiba microcontroller it uses the 8085 series um, microprocessor I mean that is the DMA controller, and what this is responsible for doing is when the frame, when the when the teletext um, data comes in, it gets buffered up. It will go into the FIFO, but before any transactions can happen, this chip here is the ROM. This ROM contains the framing code, uh, and the reason why it's removable is I bet you they can have different framing codes. At one time, they probably thought about doing that. They had different framing codes, so a certain set of receivers could receive one packet and another one maybe, I don't know. I don't know what they ever did with that, but that contains the framing code that this board responds to. So once it sees the framing code, 
it starts a background transaction and it sets up DMA, which allows the teletext frames to be read directly from the FIFO into RAM, into a specific spot in memory, uh, through the DMA controller while this processor is out doing something else. Um, it, it all happens in the background, so the CPU doesn't have to use up resources to copy teletext frames in because they come in pretty fast um, over the subcarrier. Uh, and if it doesn't see a frame within one second, it loses data lock anyways. So, aside from that, I for, I think this chip here is the, um, the real-time clock. Hold on. Let me print out the schematic, because I reverse-engineered this board into a schematic, so it'll allow us to go through that before I go any further. This is the ROM. This contains the operating code for this particular board processor. That is the Duart dual serial port for RS-232. One of them runs off here. Another one runs out here to the back plane, but it's not used on this back plane. There's no wires there. So that RS-232 port is not used anywhere. One goes here, but nothing plugs into it. So this chip really just does nothing. It just sits here and does nothing. Um... And then that's the DMA controller, as I said. That's the RAM, ROM, and I believe this is the real-time clock. Pretty sure. I may be wrong. I need to look that up. I forget what that actually is. So let me, actually, let me do that real quick before I look more like an idiot than I already am. Alright, that is an analog to digital converter. So I took a quick look, and that's exactly what this is doing. This is reading the sensor data off the rear. So these machines are designed to where you can you can actually let me let me show it in the camera. That way you can understand what I'm talking about. But uh, there's sensor nets that plug in here, and those sensors allow you to see wind speed, direction, humidity, temperature. All that stuff, like you would get a modern weather station for your home, put it up on the roof and have a wireless display or something reporting to the Amazon web service or weather underground or whatever. Same thing, except this machine can handle it directly. So there are switches in the front here, and those switches are designed for addressing. So you can address the zone, county, all that stuff, as well as um, the actual address of the receiver, so that way... Um, it can be set to specific locations by the address. Considering it says satellite transponder addressable receiver, well, there's your address. One of these bits turns on whether it uses the local sensors or uses the um, data that's sent down from TWC. Unfortunately, this board is stuck in local sensor mode and it will not allow, you know the actual data from TWC to come down from page 50. So paid teletext page 50 contains the LDL data, but you can look that up in the patent. Um, anyways, so there's something going on with the logic. It's either this chip that's bad or one of the, the 74 LS 138s are designed for routing all of this. So one of these two or that one is bad, but we'll figure that out later. Um, that's really it for this board. So this is responsible for demodulating the subcarrier data into a digital bitstream, which gets loaded into this FIFO. Then a, there's a DMA or DMA controller is set up by the main program. So once the framing code is matched and this has data loaded into it, it gets buffered into RAM and a flag is set from the DMA controller. So an interrupt gets triggered and this will handle all that off. So, that's all that that does. And then these are the opto isolators for controlling the PIO that is also on the back for running relays, commercial ad insertion equipment, pre-roll for VCRs back then, the U-Matic machines or whatever else that could be hooked up to that for running local advertising would be handled by that. And then the audio and warning tone, the warning tone generator is over here. The 74LS00 is, hand, is the warning tone and the 7414. All that's the warning tone and the this is the op amp for the audio stages and then that's the analog mux for switching the input between warning beep um, 
subcarrier FM audio or local audio, satellite audio from the receiver, stuff like that. And this is all the audio stage. These two chips here are responsible. These are the counters for counting the number of bytes that come in and keep, like I said, the Teletext frames are all handled in hardware. The CPU doesn't do anything with it. So everything is handled, buffered up into the FIFO and then a DMA transfer occurs in the background through that chip. That's how this board works. And these are all your status lights like subcarrier alarm, data, addressed, pre-roll, stuff like that. I'm not sure exactly which ones are which because there's no labels, but that's what these lights do. Um, and this sets the baud rate for the FSK carrier lock, which is around uh, 124.8 K bits per second. So that's what it runs at. But it's not RS-232. It's some completely off-the-wall proprietary um, hardware encoding. Also, it has a hardware cipher. They probably that that's another theory that they switched to subcarriers so they could hide the data because back then the teletext frames were sent in in the plane in the clear on the video lines that were at the top. So that means in theory you could steal the weather data countrywide that they were transmitting and reusing it elsewhere, basically pirate it. So they probably designed this on purpose to prevent people from pirating the weather data. So, because you, the, the encoding coming in here is not plain text. It's all scrambled and it's all set by specific hardware encoding that's in here. And that's what I had to reverse engineer to get the data to work properly on the Junior because the Junior Weatherstar Jr. uses the same exact data stream that this does. Also, this data stream was also used on the 4000. The difference being is the Teletext frames were retransmitted on a different subcarrier that was compatible with the 4000, but it was the same exact data, and it came from a VAX, VAX, VAX workstation, is where all of this stuff came from. A PDP-11 uh, mainframe you know, was responsible for all that, but... Um, that's how all this stuff was run, was run from VAX workstations and a PDP-11 mainframe. As far as I'm aware, that's, that's the story anyway. So that's it for the subcarrier board, data board. So we'll move that out of the way. And then we will take a look at this board here. This board, this board is Star 2 Video, Revision, something in there. Let me flip that around. So this board is responsible for Genlock. Um, I do not have the schematic of this board yet. It has to be reverse engineered. Um, the, the block diagram schematic, the simplified schematic, is in the patent for this board. So you can see that. This machine was manufactured or, or designed and manufactured by several companies. CompuVid TechScan was responsible for a lot of this because they manufactured EAS character generators and titlers and all that stuff back then. They helped make this thing. And it was also in part by Wegener Communications, and that's likely who designed this board. And there's some Wegener Communications ROMs on here too, so uh, they had their hand in this as well. Probably Wegener for the satellite side and CompuVid for the Genlock labeler side, but Anyways, so this board is responsible for generating the NTSC timings because there's the pixel clock. These are also impossible to find now, but these are gated oscillators responsible for timing the horizontal sync and vertical sync and stuff like that for the pixel clock to getting things on screen properly. And then that is your pixel clock. This is a retrofit board that looks like it was made to replace a chip that was there at one time that must have been discontinued so they made a new one. This is the NTSC timing generator from Sony. A 7930A. Or that that may even be the date code 87. I don't know. Um, let's see what is this? Nope. 1982. 1980. No, I don't know. Let's see, let's take a look at some of these. 88. No, this is this was made in 88. So, 87, 88. It might just be a BN07. Might be the part number. I'm not sure. But that's the NTSC timing generator. So, 
that has a gen lock input. So if there's a video signal coming in, it will gen lock everything to it. But if not, this will generate its own NTSC timing signals that run this board. Uh, and this is the main clock source for it, which is the 14.31818 megahertz oscillator, which is the pixel clock. That's the NTSC pixel clock. Um, up here, though, is the actual video switching logic. What this is designed to do is allow the back, because this does not have a frame buffer. This is generated on the fly. The characters are generated in the background colors, like the purple you saw back then, stuff like that. That's all generated on a fly, and it's done through this switching logic. So if we look at that, we have analog muxes in here, and we have uh, video amplifier circuitries. This is a video amplifier for composite video in and out. That, the DG191, is the mux for switching, high-speed switching the pixel between video. This one, I think, is for video or, or character or background colors. This switches between characters and background colors, okay? These guys are actual, these are diodes, and they're using these as switches as somehow as well, because I guess they're fast enough to use as a switch. This switch between, this is switching between foreground and background colors, or foreground text, uh, text drop shadow and background color switching is done through here, but video or character graphics are switched through there. So for each and every single pixel at, at the pace of 14.318 megahertz, this is switching one or the other. So this switches into key, key frame, key video or switches, you know, that's how that works. And there's a couple more over here doing similar tasks. And if I'm not mistaken, that 82S123, that is the background color ROM. Pretty sure that's the color ROM. This contains all 16 uh, colors that generate, and it's and it's 4-bit red. Or no, this is 8-bit, so I think it's 3-bit red, 3-bit green, and 2-bit blue is what this does. That's it. So it's eight bits of background color information, but the ROM is in three bit red, three bit green, two bit blue. That's how that works. So you're kind of limited on the number of colors that you can have for a background. Um, but yeah, then we have our tuning circuits, all that stuff, all that. I, I haven't gone into detail. I want to get the schematic done for this and maybe I'm in this video, maybe not, I'm not sure yet. But this is the analog video muxing and amplification circuitry. That's what this is doing. This is doing the switching between the different sections based on the pixel, at the pixel clock speed, as well as video amplifying local and satellite video input and output. All that's done is all that's handled here. And this is the timing logic for everything. So that is this board. Now we get down to the last board. That is the star two control board. Otherwise, this is the board responsible for generating everything that's on screen. So all of the character data, the teletext, the actual pages of data, the crawl, advertising crawl, all that stuff is stored in this memory. So that that's this memory here. Now, this, these, Five ROMs are the character ROMs. These are where the characters are stored. The font, the typeface, all that is stored in these ROMs. And it's assembled in real time as as this is being clocked and scanned, as the roster is being scanned. The, the characters are assembled in this logic in real time on the screen. There is no frame buffer memory. The only thing that's buffered in here is the text data. Everything that needs to be displayed on screen and when is buffered in these chips. So... This board here parses all the teletext frames and generates the raw character data that then gets sent out to this board through these processors. So again, we have another 8085 CPU. So there's a second CPU that's responsible and another DMA controller, 8257. Uh, the DMA controller, once again, is responsible for clocking the teletext data out where it needs to go 
and 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 when it's in raw character form, we, it, you know, it goes where it needs to go. Um, so because this doesn't have a frame buffer, it's got to crawl things on screen and stuff like that. That's all done in Logic. So these chips here are actual FIFO memory, like four bit in and out FIFO memory. And there's a cluster of them because on a WeatherStar 3, if you remember when an alert comes in, you get the red screen and you have the text that's crawling up on the screen. That's done through these rotational buffers. Uh, same thing with the crawl. When the crawl is at the bottom of the screen on the lower display line, how you know it starts crawling like this, you get the characters coming across the screen and then it recycles. Done by this. It's the characters being loaded in here and then drawn out through the timing and put back in. So the the, the roster scanning and on-screen graphics are all done at pure logic. There's no CPU involvement at all. There's very basic involvement when it comes to reading up the ASCII data and then converting it to on-screen pixels is done through the CPU, but um, outside of that, that's all it does. The clock is read by the CPU. This is the real-time clock. That's the one, because there's the crystal and there's the adjustment for the accuracy. So that's the 32.768 kilohertz crystal, and that adjusts the accuracy, but that's the real time clock that gets to the time and date that's shown on the screen is kept in memory kept in all that and that's handled by the cpu all that stuff's handled by the cpu so um let's see the lm311 some filter capacitors there's the latches for addressing because the 8085 just like the 8051 is multiplexed address data so you got to have the demuxes to to break the lower and upper address lines apart from the data lines. It all has to be done through those. So the RAM holds everything. This is the select logic for the RAM. That breaks the RAM down. It makes them individually addressable from that chip there. This is the program ROM. Again, Wegener Communications. So Wegener had their hand in this. Um, uh, that makes me think that this is gen this was designed by CompuVid TechScan. This must have been their standard character generator board at that time. But because of the way it has to handle satellite data rolling and crawling and all that stuff, which most character generators can't do, this logic had to be custom designed to handle that. Um, so that this, the FIFO handles the data rotation and the rolling and all that stuff. I'll, I'll get into a schematic later and get into better detail later because I'm trying to get this done for a project coming up here in October. But um, yeah, so that's done in this logic. This logic is responsible for animating the rolls and crawls and all of that stuff. And this is responsible for, for getting the data in and out of the teletext frames, as well as providing the clock information and the actual text that's going to be drawn. It's got to be read from RAM, and that's set up by the DMA. So the data from here read via DMA into the FIFOs and the character ROMs. The outputs from the character ROMs are assembled in this logic into 18 bits wide by 32 or 36 bits tall. So these are 18 by 18 and 18 by 36 fonts. And a lot of that's discussed into the patent anyways, but that's how this board works. And really, that's all there is to a star, original weather star. It can't do any graphics because it's not designed to do graphics, but that's really it. Uh, the last thing to this puzzle is, like I said, this is not reading the set flags correctly for the sensors, so that's got to be fixed. Uh, we're going to work on that in a bit, but the second thing we got to work on is this backplane. This backplane has a pile of bad solder joints, and um, let's see, I don't know if I can get it in frame here. Let's see if I can, where's my uh, flashlight here it is. So back here is a pile of, let's see if I can see through the fan vents. There's a pile of solder joints back here on the back plane connector. And most of these are bad. Not all of them. There's, there's, there's a few of them that are just defective. They just need resoldered. So I got to get this board out of here to resolder it. That's going to be fun because screws come through the front that hold these card edge connectors in well guess what they're mounted through the front and because of this ear it's not going to pull out that way and the boards in the back so 
this whole metal thing has to come off, which means the only way that's going to happen is if I get that out of the way again. The only way that's going to happen is if this comes out, but it's screwed here and here. So that means I got to get take the two screws out here. There's two screws on the bottom of this one. There's probably screws up in front here. Yeah, this whole thing's, this is all one piece. Same thing here. It's all one piece. So this whole thing has to come out. At least enough to where I can get access to the screws. Or, no, nope, that's bent. That's folded. That ain't going to come out. So I'm going to have to loosen this whole thing up and lift that up. Just enough to get this out by taking the three screws off on each side of here. So I can carefully fold this out and re-solder all of the uh, connections that are on the card edge connectors because they're pretty bad. That's step one. Step two is to take a look at the logic that's on the data board. So let's get these cards slid back in so I don't get them damaged because this does not belong to me. So I don't want to damage them. So, yeah, that logic I see, or these two, these three, I got to take a look at. That's the only thing I can think of, because according to the patent, the sensor net is red from one of these switches. So, I can confirm the switches are good, but it's one of those three chips, because that's how the select logic works on this. So, anyways, that... That's step two is I got to fix that. I can fix this, fix that. Step three would be potentially recapping that power supply because the last thing I want to have happen is this cause this to get damaged because there's going to be a compile or there's going to be a compile, a pile of components on this board that are not going to be available. So yeah, um, I think that's the next step. Let's get that out of there so we can work on this thing and get this thing fixed. So now, after the hell going through to take that apart, uh, now the fun begins. I got to get the soldering iron through there, try to snake it between all these cables because I can't, I can't, I mean, there's too many wires. I can't just unsolder all that stuff and try to solder it all back on. So I'm going to try to work between all these cables. Yeah, it's going to be fun, but it is what it is. Let's turn my exhaust fan on. And, uh, yeah, we'll get busy. That's warming up over there. Let's get her done. Well, that was a royal pain in the ass, but I managed to get them all. And I had to keep finagling and moving these wires out of the way as I was soldering it because it was just, it was so hard to get in between there. But what made it worse is these, these solder joints did not want to reflow and it kept drossing up my tip. So... Yeah, I had to bounce back and forth between the desoldering gun and the soldering iron and pull out bridges, and that was fun. That was really, really fun, like the game of operation. And when I say fun, I don't mean fun. But unfortunately, it was a necessary evil. Uh, solder joints aren't perfect because, well, you know, it's just crap. But I'm going to check it all here and make sure I don't have any shorts. This one here needs touched up. I'm sure I don't have any potential bridges. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's, yeah, it's crap. But it is what it is. Not much I can do about it. The middle one and the end one looks pretty good. Well, almost. Yeah, I gotta go through and clean it all up. Alright. Just clean it all up. Alright. Finally got our back together. Um, it's Again, it's not perfect. But it's better than what it was. I'll have to get a zip tie and you know, anchor all these back down. But for now, the next thing I want to tackle while I have this apart is I want to take a look at this power supply. And I want to see... The state of the capacitors whether you know how good they are i want to see the solder joints i want to 
I just want to expect uh, inspect 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 Mike I want to inspect everything and make sure that um, everything's all okay as far as that's concerned touch up any bad ones and things like that so I may it'll probably be in a second video but I may order the capacitors and rebuild this power supply and then I want to add additional protection circuitry to this power supply and you'll see that most likely in an upcoming video but for now I want to go through it and make sure everything's okay for to, to, to safely run this thing basically that's where I'm at so first thing we want to do is I've already got the screws loose on the, the bottom side there's four screws on the bottom so this thing's now loose but what we need to do is unplug the Molex connectors that power everything and that's going to be fun in of itself and it looks like this one's loose anyways yeah these things have probably not been out since 1982 but and let me work with these for a little bit and get these out all right that's out of the way now I got the power supply out, these two Molexes, and this one have to come unplugged. So, what I want to do now is want to inspect. Let's see, grab my flashlight. Let's see, there's a 7905, which I won't have any problems out of really. LM238. What I want to do is I want to clean all this crap off of here, and I want to figure out what each one of these are well I know what a 7905 is and make sure there's no chance that the 5 volt can go short and cause a ton of problems that's number one the other thing I want to do is I want to check the solder joints of all of this stuff underneath here which I think is pretty because this is yeah that's loose alright so to get this board out I'm gonna have to remove these tran they're in sockets. So to get these this board out, I have to remove all these TO3 transistors. So we know that goes one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so when we put them, pull them out, put them back in, we can put them back in the right way. So let's get this board out of here. I got all the transistors out. Um, one thing I am noticing is there is cracked solder joints, but it's especially bad. I don't know if you can see it around these transistor legs the to 3 yeah you can kind of see it there really bad right there and on these molex connectors so i'm definitely going to be resoldering this board um as far as capacitors taking a tally we have one two three four five six fifteen microfarad caps which is an oddball value um they're they're probably okay but i don't know it's hard to say this thing this thing was under 24 7 usage for years and years and years so i'm probably going to change those there's a 100 microfarad at 35 volts over here but perhaps more importantly there are three 2200s that are an axial leaded which i don't know if i have those i'm going to have to look and see i know i have them in radial but i don't know if i have them in axial and it's getting harder and harder to get axial capacitors now anyway. There's only like a couple manufacturers left for them. So anyways, there are the four um, batteries, rechargeable batteries. They're probably toast and they need to go away. So they will likely go away. And then, yeah, that's it. These wires are kind of short, so I can't really maneuver this thing that well. But that's fine. I can work with it like this. So let me go through my parts bin and see if I have the caps to redo this board. Definitely going to be redoing the solder joints because I can't, I don't feel safe operating this thing when it's like that because again, the components on the digital logic boards are going to be nearly impossible to find. I'd rather spend the extra time and work on this than risk blowing up the boards on something that is nearly unobtainium. You're not gonna be able to get parts to fix this thing, at least not not easily anyways, unless you go to the, through the, the typical China channels, which who knows what you get with that. But um, point is, 
I need to take care of this. Also, um, I need to figure out how the 5 volts is developed on this board. Uh, and the 12 volts, all those supplies from that. Because if those are standard transistors, which I don't think they are. Um, but if they are, then I want to add Zener diode protection to this board. So if there is ever a fault condition where one of those transistors shorts collector to emitter, if it's a series pass regulator, it's going to shoot whatever this is providing it off to the 5 volt rails which will destroy everything in its path so i can't do that i want to double i want to verify the how the design of these internally if, if it's in the data sheet um and if i see any areas of concern i'm going to add zener protection to the output or basically crowbar protection to the output of those of this circuit so um we'll see I got the battery pulled. It's now been removed. I need to tape off these so they don't short out with anything, but that's the battery. Um, these are the same batteries that are in the Macintosh Portable, I'm pretty sure. Mm, boy, 1986? I don't know. I'm not sure how you read those codes, but yeet. Get rid of that. Gone. Out of there. Surprised it didn't leak, but I don't think I've ever run into any of those that have leaked. Kind of neat, which is nice. They definitely don't make them like they used to. And it's not a Varda, thank God. So, uh, yeah, now I gotta go through my cap stash and see what I have. I went ahead and just changed the capacitors. I'll test them anyways, but um, I don't want to have to pull this out just to pull it out again. So I just went ahead and replaced them. Now, these little axial leaded capacitors are getting harder to find and they're getting a lot more expensive i mean they're triple the value than what they used to be just a couple years ago so i decided to just go with through hole designs i've got these uh dremel bits over here to where i can actually make holes in the board so i put them in strategically placed spots not really um so now that they're all where they're supposed to be and they're kind of in there and you know so those those six are in there. What I did was instead of going with 2200s, I went with uh, a pair of 1000 microfarad because I wanted to keep the ESR kind of low so they don't get as hot. So um, it's easier, it's, it's more efficient to parallel them than it is to do that. But I just went ahead and do that. And plus the 2200s are taller and they'll run right into this metal. So that's why I did it this way. So that's all in there now. All these... Um, other little ones are replaced, and I got the 100 microfarad at uh, 35 volts right there. It's all done, so, and the colors match. <laughs> I didn't change this one because these things hardly ever go bad. I mean, I haven't seen one bad yet. Not to say that it's not impossible, I just haven't. So now, really, I need to just tape these up, hide them away so they don't short against anything, put it back in the chassis, and attempt to power up without the logic boards in and I'm going to probe the voltage rails and make sure that they're all stable and within spec. They might run a little high because there's no load on it, but it should be still within a certain reasonable um, spec. So we're going to do that next. Alrighty then. My other phone died, so now I'm switched back to my old phone. But uh, So if it sounds different, that's why. Power supply's back in here, it's mounted in, everything's all plugged in. At this point, really, it's a matter of an initial power up and make sure that shit doesn't explode into a ball of flames. As long as we don't have that, then we'll be all right. But what I wanna do is I have my um, voltage voltmeter set up. So let's plug this in, make sure it doesn't blow up. Hold on, power. Something's going on here. What do we got going on? Oh, I know what the problem is. Yep, the adhesive failed for that. So that's just rubbing against the fan. Mmm, okay. I'll have to figure that out later. Fan's running. At this point, is just 
checking to make sure that we have voltage. Let's see if the chassis is grounded. Then we'll use it as a ground. Don't know if it is or not, but all right. Well, what I need to do. Suppose. Mm, mm -mm. All right, hold on. Let's check here. Let's check the output of these ICs. 3.8 volts. 5.1. All right, so I got 5 volts there. I have 5 volts there. All right. Check this one. Negative 15. Nothing. Negative 5.1. So I got minus 5.1, positive 5.1. 12.2, little high, not a big deal. Again, there's no load. I just wanted to make sure that all of these are within spec. 10 volts, 24 volts, which should give me 12.2. All right, so I got 12.2 there. Let's see, what's my voltage here? And, uh, damn. Yeah, I'm gonna have to zip tie that down somewhere because it keeps, Is that all right? I gotta figure that out. All right, well, huh? Tell you what might work here grab, scrape that off and grab some VHB because I have some VHB tape, which is the gray stuff from 3M. Might be able to fit there. Um, anyways power here got nothing down here 24.7 that kind of worries me because the capacitors were in there were 25 volt and that's what I put back in there why are they running Ugh, never mind I didn't design it 15 volts and plus positive 15 volts there all right, so I have both 5.1 volts here, 5.1 volt. All right, so both my five volt supplies are dead on. Both my five volt supplies are dead on. Um, my 12 volt supply is there and my negative five volt supply is there. And there, there's a there's one down at the bottom I can't get to, which is probably the negative um, 12 volt. So, so we got two positive fives, negative five, positive 12, and a negative 12 down there. So that's our power supply. Uh, it seems to still be okay, and I think it was okay before, but I just wanted to take care of that problem. But let's get this out of here and get some tape on there. Try to pull this back again because there's a lot of force on here alrighty then some fresh VHB later it's in place I scraped all the old stuff off so now that yeah that's not going anywhere so it's on there now that's fixed there's another one up here too but it's still on there and it's not as critical so we're just gonna leave it alone uh, however that one's all on there so now we shouldn't get any noise Yep, all good. Well, let's get the boards back in here and see what happens. All right, boards are in place. We got power. No smoke. All right, so let's get a, um, a monitor hooked up and see what we got going on, see what happens. All right, so this machine is too cool to be using an LCD, so I had to bring out an era-appropriate display. So, go ahead and get her on. 
And then, once that warms up a little bit here, let's flip the power on and see what we get. Mm, still in sensor mode, which I figured that was going to... Whoa, 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 whoa. Interesting. Okay. All right, well... I suppose at this point... I need to get the, um, let me try that again. Power down, power back on. You can actually glitch these a little bit. Wind chill factor, yeah, it's still in this LDL mode. All right, well, we still gotta look at that, but we now have the machine coming on, which I suspected that was going to be all right. So, uh, now what I need to do is get the actual data modulator hooked up and get data going into this thing. But not only that, I have to do the um, video signal as well because this thing will not work properly without. Well, you got to have video input for it to go into data. But um, yeah, let's get the modulator hooked up let's get all that hooked up and then we're going to do some more testing and make sure this thing works properly if not then we know we have to work on that board so all right the sdi the analog stuff didn't work out i tried it it was being a pain in the ass so i'm not even going to screw with it i'm going to go back with old uh reliable here time-based corrector so let's turn the power on to the machine all right, power is on to the machine. Then we're going to turn on the time-based corrector. So the time-based corrector is now on. All right, uh, now it's time to plug in power to the data source modulator, which is right here. All right, we are powered up. Will we get anything? Hmm. Oh, you know what? I've got to set the switches. Alrighty then, Will. Yeah, I got nothing. Alright, yeah, I got to set the switches. Alright, well, data's coming through at least. I just got to set the switches. So, let me get that all figured out and we'll try this again. Alright, so, basically, these switches down here set the address what what this receiver listens on as far as which data it's going to receive um and the modulator is all set up the encoder modulator is all set up on the data source the aggregator that server we have set up uh, it's designed to transmit at a specific address so i have to set this properly um now how all this works is again you gotta look at the patent but um in a nutshell, you have your NWS zone, you have your time zone, radar, all that, all that stuff, sensors and stuff like that. So, what we're going to do is we're going to turn the power on. Now that we got everything set. One thing I noticed right away is the sensor information is going away. Whereas before, it wouldn't do that. It kept being on there. So, I'm thinking whatever I fixed, I believe the, the back plane bad solder joints and the power supply was causing that fault but we'll see anyways let's turn the video on make sure everything comes in again i hope i may have to reset the modulator yeah i'm pretty sure i do Try again. Reboot. Hopefully we get something now. Oh, there we go. We got something. And yes. The LDL is now rotating the data that's being sent down. That's much better. All right, perfect. 
the time a time of day does it gets transmitted every one minute so at the top of the minute so that won't pop up until it gets the data from the server when the server blasts out the time of day information so that won't show up yet but right now it appears that the system is working so yeah that's nice that's uh, a lot further than what we got before see there we go time of day is now set so perfect this machine is fixed so both air conditions I had were, were, were good so it wasn't the logic that was at fault like I thought earlier it was something to do with the back plane and the power supply so we actually fixed that problem by doing some preventative maintenance so that's it that's that's a wrap for this video and that's the modulator that, that you know that's what does all of the uh, encoding of the data the FSK subcarrier which you saw a little bit of that in my junior video but so really this wasn't a very elaborate video um, but I think that's going to wrap this one up. There might be a part two on doing some further analysis on how the video circuitry works. But for now, this this pretty much concludes the main video here. So um, thank you for watching. The Discord link to join my Discord server is in the description below. And if you have a comment, please feel free to leave one. Until next time, guys. Thank you for watching.